We are recording. Thank you. That would have disappointed Swapna if I didn't capture her presentation. So. Okay. Uh, Randy, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So let me just get into presentation mode for a second and uh, we can get going. <clears throat> just one second, please. Okay. All right, so uh, Randy, you're able to see my screen. Just one more confirmation. Um, yeah, we just unlike the when we did our test, I'm seeing the next slide as well. Okay, uh, let me try this. Um, okay, you let me be, just. You might yeah. need to unshare. There we go. It. Yeah, there we go. I try think you should be there. Is that good? No, we still see your next slide. Okay. Hit F5. Hit F5, okay. There. All right. All right. You know what, we'll just continue this way. So, okay. yeah, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining uh, this, uh, uh, this evening. And uh, I'm very happy to share a few, um, uh, few experiences on achieving this Explore the Universe certificate. Um, and I'm going to just start with uh, talking a little bit about uh, the requirements of Explore the Universe uh, program, which is offered by the RASC. Uh, first of all, I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, going through this uh, RASC uh, course. Uh, it's aimed at the novice visual uh, astronomer. It's been awarded since 2002, so it's been around a long time. It's open to all uh, RASC members and non-RASC members, so anybody really can uh, take this challenge on. Uh, the certificate, the good news is it can be completed using the unaided eye, uh, binoculars, or telescope. Uh, and the only caveat here is the telescope needs to be uh, without the go-to functions. Uh, so no astrophotography is actually also uh, permitted. So this is truly a visual program. The idea here is you get to learn uh, how to navigate the sky, uh, get to learn the key objects in the sky, and there's quite a variety of observing objects, which I'll get through to in a minute. The targets are available across all four seasons. They can start at any time of the year, uh, but know that it'll take a minimum of three months, but it can take six months or more. It really all comes down to uh, the weather conditions, as we all know, uh, and what's up in the sky and where you're observing from. Uh, for me personally, it took about six months, which again, I'll, I'll speak to in a, in a couple of minute, minutes. Um, all observations must be logged and they need to be submitted either to your own center, if you're affiliated with the Missaga Center, I submitted it to uh, Joe uh, for evaluation. Or if you're, with the national, if you're affiliated with the national office or you are a non-RASC member, then you would be submitting uh, your logs over to the national office for evaluation. Uh, we have five categories uh, that we have to cover as part of the Explore the Universe program. And there are about 110 objects in all that you have an opportunity to look at, but you need a, a total of 55 minimum to complete the course requirements. Uh, and the categories, there's a minimum in, in addition to the 55, there's actually minimum in each category. So you're looking at constellations and bright stars, you're looking at the moon, the phases, some lunar craters, you're looking at solar system objects, including planets, uh, satellites, meteors, comet nearby, those kind of things, deep sky objects, galaxies, nebulas, uh, clusters, uh, asterisms. So you've, you've quite a variety to choose from. Double stars also across the board. And again, all of these are spread across the season. So you could even start tonight if you wanted to uh, and kind of go from there. Um, the, there's a lot of great information on the, on the RASC website uh, if you are curious to learn a little bit more. Uh, I want to also share some of the resources I utilize. By cer certainly, by no means do you need to uh, look at all of these yourself, but these are, these are the resources that actually helped me, so I'm sharing those with you. Uh, Explore the Universe book is um, uh, on the RASC uh, website. It's, it's about $18. There's a newer version out. I, I checked this morning, there's a newer version out. This is the older version that I'm showing. This was a beautiful book, nice, small, compact, easy to carry, 
gave all the information I needed to get started. And as I was going through, so it's a nice comprehensive little text, if you like. Uh, it's also available in French if you prefer the French version. Uh, YouTube, the RASP YouTube size has 10 videos. Uh, so through the pandemic, Jenna Hines, if you know Jenna Hines, she hosted 10 Explore the Universe specific uh, sessions with guest speakers uh, over a 10 week period. Uh, you could attend them live, uh, but now they're obviously on YouTube and you can watch them anytime, they're free of cost. What I actually watched all of them, either I attended in person or I watched them after, if I couldn't attend in person, I watched them after. Uh, and they give you little hints uh, on what to look at. They, they, they cover uh, several of the observations. It's Target, Explore the Universe Certificate, and they give you hints what to look for. They also, um, you know, just, just, just talk it through a little bit with you. Uh, so that I found very helpful. Sky Safari is an app I have on my iPhone. I live by it, uh, has been very useful for me. Uh, one thing I would actually add to this repertoire of resources would be a star chart, a physical star chart. That's something if I ever do another program, I'd be actually using another star, a star chart and that just helps with the learning. Uh, the equipment I used. So it's a very startup equipment. You don't have to invest a lot. Um, a set of binoculars, astronomy set of binoculars, a decent small telescope, a comfortable chair. Uh, so in my case, and I'll get to the sunglasses in a second. Uh, in my case, the binoculars, I actually have a nice uh, Canon image stabilized set of binoculars. In fact, I'll, I'll be honest, I actually got it for this program because I just found it, it got too wobbly for me to try to keep looking up in this guy. So I, I invested in a nice set of uh, binoculars. Um, a small telescope, I have a Vixen R5 Newtonian, nothing fancy. Um, very basic eyepieces is from Celestron, 7 to 12 mm for planets and about um, 18 to 25 mm for deep space objects. Uh, I invested in a little Muscoka chair for the backyard, They're very helpful. You can also lie on the grass if, if the weather is nice. The sunglasses for the moon were actually important for me uh, because when you get into those lunar um, observations and as you're looking through for craters and you're looking through the month, um, the, the moon can get very, very bright as you know. Uh, and I can't put eye, so like an eyepiece on my binoculars. I can put it on. Uh, a moon filter on my telescope, but I cannot put a moon filter on my binoculars. So what I did is I just picked up my sunglasses and looked through the binoculars, and I used the sunglasses even to look through the telescope to finish my observations, especially when it comes down to lunar craters. I have since invested in a, in a moon filter for the telescope, and I'm looking forward to using it. Uh, one caveat though, if you're wearing sunglasses at night, be careful not to trip and hurt yourself. So that's the one caveat I would give you. Um, some highlights of my observations. So I, as I mentioned, there's a minimum of 55 uh, observations. I completed 60 in about uh, six months across those categories that I mentioned. Most of these observations were actually from my backyard in Oakville, which is heavily light polluted. But the good news about this program is that uh, this caters very well to a light polluted uh, city like Mississauga or Oakville or, or the GTA really. Um, for some of them, like the deep sky objects or getting into a little bit more uh, double stars, um, took advantage of our cottage trips out to Muskoka, Long Point. And I had an opportunity to go to Binbrook one night, so I used the, those three locations in addition to uh, my primary Oakville location from my backyard. For my per, uh, uh, personal learning, it was a great way to learn star hopping, identifying a variety of constellations I had not been exposed to previously how to log an observation, the details that go with it, the drawings that go with it. Uh, and frankly, I enjoyed finding DSOs the most. To me, that was the biggest talent and the most fun when I actually found them. Uh, and uh, you'll see the little uh, pictures of the log over here. These pages are actually on the, log, on the RASP website. You just download them, you print them, uh, and print as many copies as you like, and they're just blank pieces of paper and you fill them out. These have to be submitted. Uh, as part of your certification requirements. From a challenges perspective, not that different from any other astronomy challenge that one might have. Uh, moonlight, light pollution, clouds, humidity, dew were all factors uh, that slows you down. I, you know, I did most of mine in the summer as most people would do. Um, all of those were factors, they continue to be factors. 
the targets are also spread across the different seasons, so you do have to really wait. And my observations were typically in the evening, 9 p.m. to midnight, so after dinner, but I'm not, a, I'm not somebody who can stay up at night or get up super early in the morning. Uh, for that reason and that reason alone, um, I had to just wait for the targets to rise well in the sky and above the horizon so I could see them. Uh, I also found that I had to do some repeat observations because I wanted to confirm what I was looking at. It was part of learning. It was, I was not in a hurry. The idea was to learn. So I was actually happy to do those repeat observations to confirm it. When I did them, I actually noted them in my log. The, and the, the biggest challenge of this entire program was actually locating double stars. There's a lot of double stars surprisingly out there in the sky, as you know. I, was, I had to use the Sky Safari app to help me figure out what am I looking at and to make sure I was looking at the right, right double star and I was not misinterpreted. So to me, that, those were probably my biggest challenges as I went through the program. Some of the examples of my observations, you'll see two photos here. They are my photos. Uh, I actually got into a bit of astrophotography as a result of this program, so there's an added bonus. I have to mention again, photos are not required for the program. In fact, do not submit your photos. You can take them for your own fun and interest like I did. Uh, but I wanted to also capture what I was looking at. I was so enchanted by what I was looking at. I wanted to start taking photos, and that's how I got a little bit into um, astronomy. So I just wanted to show you a little bit over here, and I don't know if you can see it, but you can see the coat hanger. This is from Oakville. The coat hanger cluster, uh, Altair and Ecula. It's, so this is the category of constellation bright stars. And right there is the Lagoon Nebula. Very faint. I have a, I'm just starting out in astrophotography, and this is just very, some very basic lens that is on there. But I wanted to start capturing what I was visually seeing in addition to my drawings. Uh, some of the other examples of what I was I saw, I saw again, I said this is just a handful of the 60 that I saw. Uh, but the ones that I'm sharing with you, I've, I've probably been most excited to have seen and learned from. Uh, the solar system artificial science, so it's, uh, satellites. So as you know, the ISS, in fact, I think it passed overhead tonight. I was getting a, an alert that ISS was passing over uh, earlier tonight. Uh, but as you remember, in the summer, ISS went by us quite a few times. So we saw it going overhead many times, Long Point, Oakville, both. If you recall back in May, SpaceX had a launch of about 30 satellites. So we we're seeing them all go by. So that was that counted. Uh, the DSOs, uh, the usual Andromeda, Hercules, Orion, the Pleiades. Pleiades, obviously, the prettiest of them all, in, in my mind, uh, from, a, from an naked eye perspective. Uh, double stars, El, El Biero, I was blown away uh, with the double star, the blue and the orange that came out in that telescope, and that little telescope that I've got, it was gorgeous. Mizar, Alcor, Solana, Solana, and Lyra. Uh, a few lunar craters, such as Tycho, Tycho being one of the most famous ones, obviously. Uh, lunar Marius, solar system objects, of course, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars have done a wonderful display for us all, all summer, so lucky to have been part of that this year. And of course, we can forget Comet New Rise. The one that I want stands out to me is the Eden cluster in up in Cassiopeia. That was absolutely gorgeous. And uh, we've seen it, I've seen it multiple times now. And it was so fun to watch that uh, cluster. It looks like ET. If you haven't seen it, go take a look at it. It's awesome. Those are optional, optional observations, so they're not required. Uh, so in summary, it's a very fun and safe pandemic activity. You can do it from your own safety of your own backyard. The good thing is it's open to RASC and non-RASC members. Very low investment. Uh, you just basically need uh, some interest. Uh, look out, look up. Uh, maybe a binoculars if you have one at home. And if you have a small telescope, as long as it's not a go-to and no aspect of photography, you're good to go. Uh, it's a quick reminder, again, 55 minimum across those different categories, 110 to two step. Uh, you want to make sure you want to be logging those um, observations. And then at the end of it, once you send it over to your um, center uh, head to look at it, and once they've approved what you've looked at, then you get a little certificate and pin. I've got a little picture here. with a little certificate and a pin that went with it. So a little bit of an accomplishment there, or feel felt feeling of an accomplishment. So I highly recommend this program to anyone who's wanting to learn more about the sky or just wanting to enhance their observation skills. And of course, RASC is fantastic because they don't just don't have Explore the Universe. They have a number of pro programs you can choose from. Uh, to cater to the level you're currently at. So for me, I'm starting out sort of with Explore the Universe, Explore the Moon is another great starter uh, program. And then there's tons of other programs you could do, uh, some requiring much more sophisticated equipment than, than what I use. So with that, uh, Randy, back to you. 
Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Swapna. That's awesome. Uh, and congratulations. Um, um, Joe uh, Vandendool is, is on the program tonight, and Joe uh, is our coordinator for the uh, observing certificate. Joe, did you want to say anything about anyone who, uh, who may want to uh, do their own uh, 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 program for Explore the Universe? Yes, by all means. Um, first off, congratulations, Swampa. I, as mentioned, I reviewed her, her, uh, her documentation, and it was superb. Far better than my own when I did it. <laughs> so um, very well organized, and uh, and that. Um, to anybody else who who did it, as 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 Swampa mentioned, yeah, it's it's uh, it's quite a good COVID activity. Um, if you're uh, if you're wanting to to really learn how to find things for yourself in the sky, uh, it's it's the best. Um, so I, I highly encourage it. Okay, great. Question. Yeah, like, question. Um, when you submit your observations for any of the programs, do you get them back? I believe you can. I I think normally you would. So, uh, so typ typically, uh, so Swampa gave me a digital scan of hers, uh -huh. and I did the same uh, when I did my program. So uh, when I finished my Messier, I, I used uh, a document scanner and just sent it off. Okay, uh, yeah, because I, I keep my Messier stuff in a, in a hardcover book um, just for posterity and I'm not gonna wanna give it away, you know, so, so I would just- And yeah, I'm, I'm doing the same thing with my, uh, with my finest NGC observations and I'll end up doing the same thing. I'll probably have to photograph uh, all of the pages. Got it, thanks. Yeah, the- uh, the, the idea here is that Joe is essentially our representative. So uh, anyone in the center can send their observations to Joe and a Joe essentially, you know, if he feels that uh, they're complete, then he just puts the request into national office. The, but there is no one in national office that would then evaluate uh, the uh, yeah. observations. Plus um, there are, as Joe said, there there's, there are other certificates, and, and Swampa said there's, you know, the uh, Messier certificate, uh, finest NGC objects. There's a, a lunar certificate, and then there's a whole astrophotography too. Okay, and there's whole and there's an astrophotography program. So there are a lot of different yeah. uh, certificates that you can work on. Yeah, yeah, highly encourage for for if you don't consider yourself a visual astronomer, uh, there's three there's there's three astrophotography certificates. I had a look at the requirements for the first one and went, hold on a second. I already have like half of these. Um, so uh, if you're if you're at all interested in that, uh, those I do believe get submitted to the national, but uh, again, that would be digital. Yeah. Also, I, I was on the RAC site the other day and I noticed that there's a, an Explore the Universe work, workbook now. Have you seen that, Joe? I have not been to the site recently. Okay. I did want to ask Swampna uh, about your lunar observing. Uh, how did you find, use, what map did you use for the craters? And, uh, and how did you find using it? Yeah, so there's lots of uh, resources on the internet from a lunar crater perspective. I actually landed up getting my hands on uh, a book that through the Explore the Universe uh, YouTube that they had recommended. I think it's 50 things to, three, to, to see through a telescope or something. They have a beautiful map. They, in the Explore the Universe little guide that I was showing too, they actually have a moon map and craters on that as well. So I actually had two resources and the internet is full of resources as well. But my go-to where the Explore the Universe book has a moon map, has moon maps in it, as well as this uh, 50 things to see through a telescope, which was recommended through the YouTube channel. Uh, I got that as well, to just through Amazon. Yeah, so that's very similar to my experience in that um, along with learning how to star hop, you learn how to find the resources that you need to complete the certificate as well um, and, and to go beyond. And, and so that's, you know, to me, that's, that's a, a bit of it as well is, is you know, you, when we watch, um, you know, I, I like to go observing with, uh, at Starfest with Chris Malicki. Chris Malicki has, has resources, maps, from magazines and, and various other uh, documents that he's collected 
um, where he builds his observing list from. And uh, and I and again, I have I have a digital map on my on my phone that I use uh, occasionally um, just to confirm if I'm looking at something or there's something else there that I wasn't aware of. Uh, because a lot of the maps I find uh, for the certificate have the target for the certificate, but don't necessarily show what else might be there. And uh, so that's it's very useful to see uh, that information as well. And one thing uh, in pre-COVID days, uh, many of you know that we run members only nights at Riverwood, and that's a perfect opportunity for someone who is working on their Explore the Universe to talk to other members uh, and ask questions and, and get pointers. So unfortunately, we're not able to do that now, but that's something to look forward to. Indeed. Swapna, th Swapna thank you very much. That was excellent. And again, congratulations. Uh, our next uh, presenter is Ron McNaughton, and his presentation is The Sky This Month. So I think it's just one slide of clouds, isn't it? Ron, you're up. Who's this Toronto thing? And Ron, you need to unmute. Ron is uh, a member of both centers. Now, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so I didn't unmute before I share screen. So, uh, all right. All right. Looks good. Can you see that? Okay, good. No. Um, I, I was asked to do the Sky This Month for the Toronto Center and I offered to do the, the same talk here. So uh, here we go. Um, I'm gonna, the plan of the talk is I'm going to start at things on the earth and end up going to deep sky. So here we go. I'm fascinated by analemmas. Um, this one was taken at the Bell Labs in New Jersey and you take a photo at the same clock time throughout a year at regular intervals and this looks like it's every fortnight. If you take it instead of the afternoon there but at local mean noon, it's an upside, uh, it's an up down pattern. And I put the yellow line to where I think due south is. And what's interesting is in November, the sun has already passed due south and started to go back down. And then it is visible at the local mean noon. But in February, it's slow and it hasn't even reached the local mean noon by the time it's whatever that time is. And I'm gonna explain that uh, in a bit. And this is all caused by the fact that we go faster uh, during perihelion in uh, January 2nd and slower uh, for other times of the year. This is part of the RASC handbook and they've stretched out the, um, um, the time axis. So there can actually be a 30 minute difference from November to February. Uh, I'm amazed it's that much. So on December 9th, we're about here. And when I extrapolate up, I get a calculation. Our meetings are normally in the Ontario Science Center and its longitude is 79.3. And when you subtract it from 75, the center of our time zone and divide by 15, you get that number of hours or 17 minutes. So our mean noon is uh, 12, 17. Now it might be 12, 18 in Mississauga because it's further west, I'm not sure how much it would be. Then you've got your adjustment for the fact that in December, on December 9th or 10th or 11th, uh, it's actually fast. So you take seven minutes away and you get a predicted local real noon time when the sun is uh, actually highest in the sky. And it's just a few seconds off the starry night prediction. So it's kind of interesting how all this works at this time of year. Analemmas were on uh, many old globes and actually you can read it and you can work out the um, uh, declination of the sun on any given day. And you also have a scale here in minutes and you can work out when your noon is going to be uh, compared to your local mean noon. Anyway, 
Uh, sunset is 440 on the 9th, and believe it or not, that was the earliest sunset for this year. And sunset gets later as we go on. Uh, it's a little complicated, and I would have thought it would have been on the uh, uh, solstice day, but it isn't. Anyway, by 624, it's astronomical dusk. The sun is 18 degrees below. It's black, and you can do 11 and a half hours of uh, observing, but you might have to visit two Tims to get enough coffee to survive that long. Uh, okay, this month in history, I added this just at the last second, and this is a Japanese, presumably scientist, in protective gear, it seems. Uh, carrying a sample that came from an asteroid and then it's going to be uh, analyzed and uh, get all sorts of useful information. Uh, the Golden Eye set, uh, that Bond movie uh, was damaged and there's some amazing videos and I understand the astronomy picture of the day this today has a, a video of, um, of it. I saw one where a drone was looking very close to the actual cable as it broke and it's kind of uh, fascinating. And in this month, uh, it was the first trip to the moon. And the Apollo 8 astronauts went, did 10 orbits, uh, took a beautiful picture that's one of the most famous in history, and, uh, but didn't land. And they made it time men of the year. Um, but the next year, uh, Neil and Buzz didn't make it, even though I think landing is more difficult than the other. But it's also the time of the last trip to the moon. And uh, Apollo 17, Eugene Cernan was the commander. And he took this picture of Harrison Smith, the only scientist on the moon. And I love this picture and uh, Gene autographed it for me. This picture, I think some of you have seen and it's so fascinating. And when I emailed Roy Bishop, he told me the whole story behind it. He and his, he and his wife visited it when it was closed, but he still got a tour from the caretaker. It was cloudy, uh, so they wandered the town and then they saw an opening coming to the west, so he walked, they walked back and then rain started. And as a optics teacher, he thought, rainbow. So he put a new roll of uh, Kodachrome 64 in the camera and his wife held the umbrella, he stood where he could and he got this picture of Newton's childhood home. Now there are two special things about this place. One, Newton did a lot of experiments with, with light, and he proved that not only can you break light into its colors, like in a rainbow or with a prism, but also you can put the colors back together again to get white. And a number of experts at the time thought he was wrong, but the rainbow is, uh, shows that. And the other is, I thought the whole story of the apple was apocryphal, but he told a number of people who recorded it you know, in, in his lifetime. Um, basically, he was uh, social distancing away from the plague at this uh, remote location. And he saw an apple falling and he wondered, well, why does it fall straight down and not on an angle? And he figured if the, whatever it is from the earth that holds us down goes all the way up to the apple tree, why doesn't it go further away such as to the moon? And Roy Bishop ended his uh, email to me with a comment that he showed that nature's laws were universal, the same in the heavens and on the earth. This is an amazing photo. I encouraged him to submit it to uh, the astronomy picture of the day. I don't know if he's going to or not. Uh, just a few rocket launches, there are a number. Um, long March from China, a pair of satellites to detect gravitational waves. I don't know whether it went up or not, I didn't check. There's an electron rocket from New Zealand and Strix A is a radar for urban planning accurate to millimeters. And in January, an Atlas 15 is to launch the Boeing Starliner uh, orbital test before it can carry people to ISS. Um, I took this picture at my cottage and I left the light on so I could find it again because I drove across the lake because the cottage view is the wrong direction amazing meteor here. Um, I got my camera just going click, click, click and got a whole bunch. And my plan is to also do it for the Geminids if we have clear skies and I'm not optimistic based on forecast now. Anyway, during a um, meteor shower, you get meteors coming from one area of the sky because basically we're going towards that. And this is in constellation Perseus. But 
We have the best meteor shower of the year. Geminids coming up in two nights. And the maximum number of particles coming from space towards Earth is at 1 o'clock uh, universal time or 8 p.m. Um, um, on the 13th. Um, the zenith hourly rate is 140, and that seems like a soft number because I've seen other people quote 150 and 120, but it's basically a lot of meteors, and they're going to be coming from uh, just by Castor, and they're going by Lynx, Auriga, um, all sorts of constellations. Orion is just going to be glorious to see, but in the evening we might not see the most meteors. This is a picture, a diagram I've made of the Earth going around the sun, and the sun is coming from, sunlight is coming from the left, so this is day and this is night. And at about 1210, we're going to have the local midnight. And at 2.50, at 2.30 in the morning, you're actually, um, uh, Gemini is highest in the sky, and the meteors are coming straight at us, and if somebody is in a really dark site that I was willing to drive to north of Orangeville and um, uh, with perfectly clear skies we might see close to the 150 um, zenith hourly rate they talk about. Anyway, uh, so later on uh, we should be able to see more. This is a diagram made in 1872 of the Perseids and the idea is you have a stream of particles that are drifting through space and Earth uh, touches them. Notice it was the 10th of August, uh, although now it's two days later. Um, Phaethon is the asteroid that's causing this and the theory was it goes really close to the sun. This is the orbit of Mercury and it probably was uh, heated so much in its perihelion passes that uh, it's lost all its volatile so it no longer looks like a comet. In contrast, Swift Tuttle has an orbit of 133 years and it's much further away and moves much faster. Now, this is from the uh, Wikipedia list of meteor showers and um, the Leonids can be much bigger, but right now they're not that uh, big. But for some reason, they're near the end of the year or at the very beginning of the year with the Quantrids. The other thing is the Geminids, notice that the speed is slower than the others. And the meteors will actually look differently unless we have meteors of rain that are blocking the view. And I'm a little pessimistic right now. Anyway, the Quantrids, uh, there's no constellation with this name, but at one time there was a constellation with that name and then when the uh, scientists put together all the constellation boundaries it got taken out, but uh, it's uh, just above Boetes. Um, various, uh, there's the uh, um, ISS passes and Heavens Above uh, lists them. Moon patterns. Phases, um, the new moon is the 14th, so we're almost at the new moon now, first quarter. So Santa is traveling somewhere where it's uh, the end of first quarter or waxing gibbous. And I don't know whether he's gonna need Rudolph's nose or not, but uh, anyway, uh, there'll be a lot of light. And on the 5th of January, it's last quarter. There are other aspects of the moon as well, specifically two of them. Sometimes the moon goes above the plane of the earth and the sun, and sometimes it goes below. And it turns out the December 14th, the moon is going south of the plane. And that also is the day of the new moon. And that means there's an eclipse, which will probably be the least watched in a uh, populated country because uh, all sorts of people I know were going to fly to uh, either Argentina or Chile and uh, you know with COVID it all got cancelled. I don't know if anybody's going from the Mississauga Center anyway but uh, uh, that's too bad. And the third thing is the distance between the moon and the, the earth and sometimes it's closer and sometimes it's further away and then the moon is a small disk and if it's an eclipse it doesn't completely cover the sun so you have an annular eclipse and if it's close then you have totality and uh, oh what could be more beautiful than an eclipse. Um, but there's other things happening this month as well. Um, this website solar system scope it uh, you can set the time uh, and the date and it shows you the uh, the planets uh it's about a thousand times the objects like the earth and the sun are about a thousand times bigger than their real sizes so 
you know, let's, uh, let's be realistic on this. And Saturn's orbit is much further away than Jupiter's. Um, on the 9th, um, in the evening, we see the objects behind us in orbit. So we passed Mars, so Mars is very visible in the evening. Good view of Ceres. And in the morning, we see the things in front of our orbit, which is Venus in terms of solar system, Mercury's behind the sun. But the star of the show is going to be Jupiter and Saturn because Jupiter moves faster than Saturn and eventually it's going to almost, uh, well, it's going to get very close to it. And that's what I'm going to talk about. The Great Conjunction, I'm first of all going to show a, um, uh, a planetarium program to what we see. And then I'm going to go back to the other thing and to show what's happening. So Saturn and Jupiter are something like a degree apart. Uh, as we go further forward, they A, get lower in the sky at the 5.30 time, and they get closer together, and then they're even closer together. Remember the new moon was the 14th, so at the, 7th, the 17th, the uh, moon is, crescent moon is going to be whizzing past. And on the 21st is the big day that we all hope is clear, because this is a big deal. Let's go back to the solar system view. So Saturn and Jupiter aren't quite lined up. Don't forget they're much smaller than shown on the diagram here. But in a few days, the Earth moves this way and Jupiter is catching up and they're almost in a line. And on the 21st, there's quite a good line between Saturn, Jupiter and Earth. Now, when can we see it? So I did an experiment on December 2, it was crystal clear and I went out and Jupiter, I looked at the sky, I knew where Jupiter and Saturn were gonna be and it took 17 minutes before Jupiter popped out of the sky. And it looked so bright, I wondered why couldn't I see it at 16 minutes, but uh, I couldn't. Interesting, I had to wait more minutes for Saturn to come out after Jupiter than Jupiter took to come out after the sun, sunset. <clears throat> So 36 minutes was enough for me to see that. But on the uh, 21st, this event is going to be lower and we might need more than 36 minutes. So I'm saying we might be able to see both of them uh, somewhere 520 to 540, but Jupiter will be visible much earlier than that. And if we put our telescope on Jupiter, uh, we're gonna see an amazing view. So at 5.30, I'm saying Saturn is going to be about 224 degrees. And what we're going to see is Jupiter. Uh, the moons don't overlap in part because the, um, the moons of Jupiter stay in the ecliptic. So as Jupiter goes past, they don't overlap. And um, we're going to see two in the same eyepiece. Uh, my um, highest power eyepiece is 26 arc uh, minutes. And these guys are going to be about six minutes, uh, six arc minutes apart. Now, are we going to be able to see them as separate dots? And um, the eye chart, apparently the 2020 line is set so at a distance. So the um, uh, letters are five arc minutes tall. So each prong of an E at that line, uh, I'm just looking here, would be one arc minute. And you would think at the closest approach, we can see two separate objects, except Saturn is 11 times less bright than Jupiter. And the surface brightness of Saturn, because it's so much further away for the sunlight to reach and then come back, is so much less. So I don't know whether we're going to be able to see, but, but I think we probably will. Where to see it? Some people on internet groups have been saying, well, let's go to the lake. Well, the lake is, uh, this is the direction at 530. Uh, it's not gonna be that good on the lake because most of the lake shore doesn't uh, uh, go over that. And also lakes at this time of year tend to be uh, foggy. Uh, maybe around Toronto Harbor, you'd get a good view. There are all sorts of uh, ravines in Toronto and, um, uh, Mississauga, and if one could find a place on the west side of a ravine, or sorry, the east side of a ravine, it might be low enough to uh, go through. Um, 
I found uh, just doing Google map, uh, Riverdale Park is on the east side of the Don Valley and the these buildings are only about a degree high so you'd have a perfectly good view from there. Um, I would love it if somebody could make a picture like this video made in New Zealand where the moon rose and you could see people looking at it. And uh, I'm not sure where a good place would be, but, and it would take a lot of planning, but that would make a stunning picture that might get to the astronomy picture of the day. Mississauga people, um, the roads are not that far off alignment at 5.30. So another possibility is to find a place where on the south side of the road, you set up your telescope and you might be able to see uh, the view, I don't know. And of course, at 6.30, the angle bends towards the west. So, uh, you know, we, we go from there. Anyway, we're not the ones most interested in this. Astrologers are. And I took some um, predictions from um, uh, different websites. And it's going to be an intense event. So even the people in rainforests that's raining all the time are going to be intensely uh, affected, I guess. Jupiter's fun-loving and Saturn is serious. So there's going to be a conflict. Uh-oh. It says it's in Aquarius, which it isn't, by the way. It's in the uh, side of Capricornus, the opposite side. Cultural things will change. Zero degrees, not in the scale that I'm used to for astronomy, meaning they're new beginnings. We're supposed to release old habits and choose a big juicy goal. And I learned a new word with this one. Jupiter's egoic greed and Saturn's conflictive focus need a balancing act of tempering. I would appreciate help understanding what that means. Predictions for your birth time, birth sign. Virgos, prepare for a great leap. Uh, we Geminis are supposed to prioritize our pleasure. Leos are supposed to communicate and Scorpios are lucky. They've got to find a lover who they can be vulnerable with. Anyway, good fun. Other great conjunctions, which means Jupiter, Saturn, they're on the 20, uh, multiples of 20 all the way through this century. Uh, we're the closest one. Uh, going back in history, 400 years ago, there was one a little bit closer, and that's uh, Kepler was still working on his uh, third law, and uh, uh, Shakespeare had recently died, and it's just a little bit closer, but uh, it was so close to the sun, nobody could see it. But 800 years ago, around when the Magna Carta was signed, there were actually two arc minutes across or apart, and that would have been quite an amazing sight, and that was very visible. 6 BCE, there was a triple conjunction. It's got to do with when we're moving very quickly when they're conjuncting. Um, and uh, one theory is that's the star Bethlehem. But other planets also have conjunctions. And Regulus, the name implies it's got something to do with kings, regicide. And Leo is the uh, lion or the king of the animals. Uh, you know, what, what's a more powerful and uh, predator than that? And in Leo, um, there was Jupiter and Venus that were really close together. And I don't know if you can see it, but it happened in June 17th, 2 BC. And they were uh, 35, zero arc minutes and 35 arc seconds, or about a hundredth of a degree apart. And unless somebody had exceptional vision, they would not be able to see it as two bodies. And given that in those days, people thought that the pattern of the stars was uh, God's giving us messages, who knows uh, what it would be taken. And one theory is three men chose to bring gold, myrrh, and incense to um, the baby Jesus, uh, the wise men. Um, who knows? Uh, there are all sorts of uh, discussions on that. Um, you might say June isn't there, but it, the December 25th was established as the birth date of Jesus only 330 years after he was born. And who knows if the date was the exact date. Okay, space missions. I guess you can't see it at your top, at least I can't. Um, but all the green are space missions that are to all sorts of different places. And at the bottom, there are even more up to 2024. Humanity is sure exploring the heavens. Um, various missions, uh, Osiris uh, Rex, 
um, landed on uh, asteroid Binu, and it's just a wonderful video. And I was so impressed with Michael Daly's talk uh, about it um, and and how the project worked and how he was able to use a laser altimeter to find things. Uh, Chengri is the uh, Chinese moon god, and they have a sample return mission to collect two kilograms, including from two uh, uh, meters deep. And last I heard, it returns on the 16th. Maybe it's going to come back early. Who knows? Perseverance rover is on its way to Mars for February landing. Uh, basically looks like Curiosity, except it's got much stronger wheels and more sensitive uh, experiments to measure organic molecules. And it has a helicopter with it. And if Ingenuity works and they can scale it up to carry things, it could be so powerful to launch these on Mars and move around and explore. Observing targets. The sun is back. They're all sorts of sunspots. Um, this is by Brian Koval, and this is a pasted together version, so it's incredible detail. And look at that prominence. Oh, beautiful. Um, there's a guy in the Toronto Centre that uh, encourages people to uh, look at double stars. If anybody's interested, I'll send you the list. So here we're looking at the winter sky with Orion and Gemini and all the interesting um, uh, things to see there. Horsehead by the belt, um, the Orion Nebula below the belt, Rosette, one of my favorite objects in the sky, far left of the belt, and the crab above. And I said I was going to go far. Here's the galaxy. This is a recent uh, painting by somebody for NASA. Uh, there's a, um, a bar in the middle of our galaxy that science says. I'm going to zoom into this area. The sun is on the Orion Spur, which is between the Perseus arm and another arm. I don't quite know the difference between a spur and an arm, but I'm zooming in. So according to this, we're there. And I did some research, and it looks like the North American is here. M42 and the horse head is here, Rosette is here, and the crab is in the Orion Spur. So clear skies and successful observing, and uh, keep in mind what their Norwegians tell their kids. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ron. <laughs> okay, um, I'll ask for questions. First thing I'll say is uh, that Michael Daly talked that Ron mentioned uh, our last speaker on uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission is on our website. So take a look at that if you haven't seen it. Any questions for uh, Ron, either in chat or unmute and just ask? Uh, can I ask a question? Sure, Chris. Yeah, my, um, my chat um, fails, so I don't know how to do that. In any case, you mentioned that not many people will see the total eclipse in three days because of the COVID. Another reason why many people won't see it is because the weather uh, forecast is dismal. All of the eclipse path in Chile is supposed to be clouded over and rainy. And in Argentina, which is supposed to have a better climatology, um, there's a 50% cloud even in the best places. So weather will be a huge problem in three days for the total eclipse. So Chris, if you were signed up to go to go to it, would you cancel the trip based on that? Not now I wouldn't. I'm just so glad that uh, my wife and I had the foresight not to decide not to go this year and I feel vindicated that we're not going. <laughs> it would be really sad and tragic to be there and be clouded out and rained out. Any other questions for Ron? Okay, if anyone has uh, not seen the uh, Starship test from yesterday, the SpaceX Starship, take a look at that. It's one of the more uh, interesting uh, tests uh, in a long, long time. Okay, thanks again, Ron. Okay, you're welcome. And, uh, yeah, and uh, our next speaker is Tom Otvos. And he's uh, been working on a uh, telescope with a thin meniscus mirror. Uh, so this is going to be interesting. He's going to talk to us about uh, his experience with working on the telescope and uh, a 
course, the interesting part, what can go wrong? Tom, it's all yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so. Is my screen visible? You are up. I am up and running. Okay, great. Okay, um, so just before I start, as a caveat here, this presentation style is a new experiment for me. I'm, I'm doing a timed presentation, so each slide has got a fixed amount of time, and I need to make my point and move on. So hopefully it won't seem rushed, and hopefully there won't be dead air as well. And, um, and then if we have any questions, obviously we can, we can talk about it um, after the presentation. So what I am going to present is uh, Artemis, which is the name of my uh, telescope. And it's uh, basically a thin meniscus mirror telescope. And this is actually an update um, because I had made a presentation both to the Mississauga Center and Toronto a couple of years ago on, um, on this project and, and, and how it started. And, uh, and most of that was focused on the details of how to make fast meniscus mirrors. So I'm going to start this presentation by actually re recapping a little bit of that. But, um, but if you're interested in it, I suggest you look up the YouTube video and, um, and you can see more of the details about the actual um, making of the mirror itself. So I'm going to start by making the case for why we, why we even want to do a, a meniscus mirror. Basically, a meniscus mirror is like a contact lens. It's thin and it's curved on the front and back and generally is of uniform thickness. So why do you want a meniscus for a telescope? Well, basically for two reasons. One is for a weight savings. And you can see here the comparison between a meniscus and a traditional uh, mirror blank. Um, and, and it's a dramatic difference in weight. Oops, there's my, damn it. Um, and then also uh, for, for cooling purposes. Now, I said I'm making a fast meniscus. So the case for why we would make a fast mirror is quite simply for portability. The faster your mirror, the shorter the focal length and the more portable the telescope is. And for me, that was all the motivation I needed. Additionally, you get um, uh, much better fields of view, which make um, certain objects quite outstanding. So how do you make a meniscus? Well, quite simply, you start by slumping glass and you use a kiln, which is pictured in the back here, um, and, a, and a programmed a proportional integral derivative controller, which basically allows you to plot over time the temperature gradient so that you can um, safely melt the glass into the shape that you want without introducing residual strain. So when I first presented this, um, it, it pretty much ended um, at this stage where the mirror was almost done and through a testing mishap actually fell and broke. Um, and after um, recovering from that, I, I basically picked up the pieces and started again. And an 18 month project that ended in this disaster, in about five months, I actually got back to where I was when the mirror broke. So once I got the mirror to the point where it was somewhat functional, um, it was all about testing. And so 2018 is where we're picking up the story. And it was basically a year of testing and validation. And all of my tests were showing that the mirror was OK, but it wasn't great. But it wasn't clear whether or not it was my test rig or whether it was a problem with the mirror. So the only way that I could really be sure about this was to build it. So the next step really came down to actually designing the telescope and building the final um, optical tube assembly so that I could test the mirror in situ and know that any problems that showed up would be a function of the mirror and not the test rig itself. Um, and so I spent a, a considerable amount of time making this design and it was based on a Mel Bartels design, um, what he called the zip dog. And this is the SketchUp model for the design. Once I had the model in hand, then I started to actually build the thing. And for the next several months, it was just a lot of laborious uh, woodworking, um, cutting out curves by hand. I didn't necessarily have the right tools for the job. And the kitchen was the staging area for large glue ups. But I just kept hacking away at it until I finally got to the final product, which is this. 
So this is what the, what the telescope actually looks like. And, um, and I'm gonna talk about some of the key design elements, but one of the things that jumps right out is function and form here. And, and I wanna draw your attention to these J arms, which are both functional in the sense that they are the, the holding the tube together, but they're also providing um, the altitude, um, the, the movement in the altitude. So I'm able to combine these two things because the, the scope is so compact. Here's a close-up of some of the mirror cell. Basically, the mirror cell is very simple. It's just a nine-point flotation. Um, each of those triangles is basically pivoting on a screw, and, um, and then each, each triangle has got three points of contact on the meniscus. And they need to pivot because remember that the back of the mirror is curved. Collimation is done through screws on the back, which I think is a mistake because it makes it hard to collimate, but um, the front of the mirror um, is, the, is another a cool innovation. This is a wire spider. So instead of normal spider veins, the actual secondary holder is held up by wires. It's ridiculously stiff, even though the wires don't have a lot of tension in it. And it's all about the geometry of the way the wires are crossing. And I've got screws that are just basically adjusting the tension to allow you to collimate the mirror. The flex rocker is what the altitude and azimuth, um, what controls the altitude and the azimuth. Um, and it's a, it's a very low profile rocker and it sits on a ground ring that um, basically has got uh, formica surface on it and Teflon bearings. And you can see a close up of, um, of small roller skate bearings which are used to keep the thing centered on the ground ring. Portability was one of the major motivations for this design, and so that extends even to the base. And the base is just a very, very simple um, three-piece folded um, Y-shaped um, thing that just collapses and, and goes into my car. Total setup time of the whole telescope um, is about three to five minutes, and that includes the base, putting on the flex rocker, and Artemis. Here's a cool shot um, where, from my backyard where I've got Artemis beside my old telescope, which is an eight inch uh, F7, the yard cannon. And, you know, and it shows the difference in both in terms of aperture and, and compactness. Um, now, actually, the reason that, that I've got this set up this way was because I was doing a lot of AB comparisons with, with visual targets so that I could shake out the optics of, of Artemis itself. Now, one of the other uh, innovations or, or cool things about Artemis is that the mirror is silvered. And the reason I chose to do that was um, primarily for cost reasons, because once you get to a certain size, al alumnizing your mirrors is very expensive. And silvering turns out to be a relatively cheap thing. But also, silver is inherently more reflective than aluminum. And even with the enhanced aluminum coatings, they're only just touching the level of reflectivity of silver. And the thing that makes this all possible um, is a product from a company called Angel Gilding, which is basically silvering at home. And typically this has been used for decorative, um, decorative mirrors, but um, we've stumbled on this and, and started using it for our telescope mirrors as well. And there are a number of people that have used this successfully. And the cool thing is you can silver your mirror for about 20 bucks. Um, the process is easy, but you need to follow it in detail. And here's a picture of my um, first silvering attempt. And I call it beginner's luck, you know, I mean, and, and really this wasn't the first silvering attempt because the cool thing is that if you make a mistake and you need to resilver, there's some additional chemicals that come with the kit that allow you to basically erase the silver and you can, um, and you can uh, silver it again. So it comes down now to two questions. Um, and, and the problem with silvering is that it tarnishes and how do you know how good your silver coating is? So a number of people that I, that I work with have developed this poor man's reflectivity test, which is basically a way of, of, of assessing how well your silver coating is doing and when it's due for a, tarn a, a recoat. And through a bunch of tests against um, um, uh, spectral radiometers, they're able to prove that this poor man's test, which just uses um, digital imaging, um, can accurately predict the reflectivity of your, um, of your mirror. Now, the other thing about um, the silvering is the tarnishing. And um, I'm going to, I'm starting to get behind, so I'm going to pause here for one sec. So if you just bear with me for one moment. And I'm going to just go back to this slide here. Okay, so 
the the chart um, shows that we can basically predict with a fair degree of accuracy what the reflectivity is of the silver. And so by comparing it over two points in time, you know that your silver has degraded to a certain point. So then it comes down to how do we retard the, um, the tarnishing? And that was another area of research that a number of people that I'm involved with um, discovered a product called Midas Tarnish Shield, which is used for jewelry, but it turns out to be remarkably effective in protecting silver. And they, um, and through a bunch of really aggressive accelerated life tests, have demonstrated that this tarnish shield actually um, protects the silver for a very long period of time. And really, our goal is to be able to silver and have it um, at least last an entire season, if not more. So, all of these things have come together, and uh, the scope had basically its first public viewing um, at Starfest in 2019, and then again at the Black Forest Star Party in September of 2019. And it was a head turner. Uh, people, people stopped and looked at it both in the daytime and wanted to come back at night. Um, wide field views of things like M31 and the Veil were outstanding. And more gratifying was Mel Bartels, who that picture was with, um, said it was a really, really great piece of optics. But um, it's never quite done. And what I, um, what I found over the course of using it for a bunch of months was that I was disappointed with the high power views. And in particular, splitting close doubles, it just wasn't working for me. And the more I used it, the more I got bugged by it. And so I'm going to go back to that slide again. Sorry. The more I used it, the more I got bugged by it. And, um, and after doing a lot of testing and eliminating things like eyepieces and comparing it to the yard cannon, um, basically all, all the other options were eliminated. And um, I came to the conclusion that the, that the surface was just a little bit too rough. And so um, when it needed to be re-silvered, I took it um, as a sign that I needed to kind of tweak the surface a little bit and take it back to the pitch lap. And so right now, actually, Artemis is offline, unfortunately. Um, but, um, but right now, I'm, I'm working on, on cleaning up the surface and uh, hopefully getting it re-silvered in the next couple of months, and then we'll be, we'll be back in business. And I apologize for how rushed that was. I, um, that was a failed experiment, but I hope you got the gist of, of what I was trying to say, and I'll happily go back to any slide that you want that you would like more information on. Hey, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, interesting experiment, but uh, one of the most difficult things is giving a presentation for the first time and trying to estimate how long it's going to take. It's, it's nearly impossible. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's an amazing uh, accomplishment, uh, what you've got there. Um, years ago, I guess, even if you're you know, 60 years ago, uh, amateur telescope making was uh, rampant, primarily because telescopes were just so expensive to buy. I think they, a half decent telescope costs as much as a car back in the 50s. So everyone made their own telescope. Now today we don't uh, we don't have that. And so it's just people like yourself who are are just into uh, you know do it yourselfers and, and wanting to do something unique. Uh, come up with these uh, these great projects. So thanks a lot for sharing that with us. Yeah, and, and and it is partly that that you know that I that I'm kind of a maker at heart, and and so I'm I'm intrigued by the challenge. But but the other thing was again the portability for me was was a big thing. So I I wanted a big scope, but I didn't really want a big scope that I wouldn't be able to transport back and forth to the cottage, for example. You know, and and so I wanted aperture, but I, I didn't I didn't want all of the extra baggage along with it. So that's why I, you know I was I was um, kind of motivated by and really intrigued by Mel's designs of these super fast telescopes. And I didn't actually mention that that this is an f two point six. So, that was my next question. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So it's an f two point six, and and so it's a fourteen inch aperture, and you know so the focal length is uh, is um, thirty uh, thirty six inches roughly. And is, the, is the design such that you could uh, adapt it for photography at some point? That's my, that was my next plan. So if I, if I hadn't, um, if, so the tweaking of the, of the surface and, and trying to make it a little bit smoother became a slippery slope. And unfortunately, I, I slipped and fell all the way down the slope. And so I've, I've had to go quite a ways back now to, in terms of figuring the mirror. 
um, but the intent was, um, you know, that um, um, that I was going to get into EAA because that's something that I'm also really interested in, and and you know, to digitally assist the views, I think that combined with the really wide fields are going to be a really really cool tool for outreach. You know, because even even the way it is now, and you know, and I'm showing friends and family, and they're looking at stuff. And if you know what you're looking at, then then you'll be really, you know, you'll be impressed. Like, you know, people were really really stoked by the views of the Vale and Andromeda, for example, at the star parties. You know, but if I show the same thing to my wife or my kids, you know, they look at it and they go, yeah, meh. You know, it's it's you know, not 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 a Hubble image, right? And yep. so EAA, I think, is, is going to be the thing that's going to bridge that gap. So, you know, if I have really wide field views and, you know, and I get a, a stacked image in 10, 20 seconds, that kind of thing, um, I think that that'll be a really, really powerful uh, um, and motivating, um, motivating tool for people to look through. Question. Uh, one, one question on the chat, and then Dennis, uh, you, uh, I'll let you go. Um, is that about as big as you can make? with the thin mirror. So in other words, diameter of mirror, are you pretty well at your limit? Absolutely. Well, uh, if you're talking about me personally, um, it is because of the fact that my kiln um, is, um, is only 17 inches in diameter. So the most, the biggest mirror that I can slump is a 16. But Mel Bartels, this gentleman right here, who's, who was my mentor for all of this, um, he is currently, um, at the time that I started this project, he was doing a 25. He finished his 25 and, um, and actually recently moved. And so he sold his 25 and currently he's working on twin 30s. So he was originally going to make a 30 inch binoscope. Um, but he's not happy with how he's going to be doing the, the binoscope design. So he's got two twin 30 inches that he's in the process of figuring right now. And, uh, and they're both like almost identical in terms of focal length. And um, uh, it, it's, it's quite astounding. And he's working them both simultaneously. So he's at a 30 inch right now. And when he's done his 30s, he's also got a 42 that's already slumped. Holy so smokes. absolutely not. And the group that we're, that we're, that's kind of spearheading some of this stuff, you know, their goal is to make it easy for um, people to have one meter telescopes. Now, not necessarily everybody, um, you know, like in, not, not, your, um, not your average backyard astronomer, but they want to make one meter telescopes very, very accessible. And, um, you know, for like universities or, or you know, whatever. Um, so it's absolutely not... Um, not anywhere near the limits. Now, one yeah. of the challenges, though, is that the bigger the bigger the meniscus, that there there is this sweet spot between the thickness of the meniscus and the diameter. So, in in my case, you know, my fourteen inch is a half inch thick, and um, you know, and and there's no signs of it potato chipping or anything. You know, when it's sitting on its edge, his twenty five inch was also perfectly fine. He is finding his thirties are actually quite um, a bit more floppy. So I think as the diameter goes up, you, you would expect that the thickness has to go up as well. Um, now, not nearly as much as, as the original, um, uh, you know, like this thing here, this is a two inch thick blank, um, uh, you know, for a 25 inch mirror, but, um, you know, but certainly it needs to be thicker than a half an inch. Mm -hmm. Dennis? A uh, question, um, with a mirror that thin, I'm curious to know uh, and understand the techniques for uh, rough and fine grinding and polishing such that you don't yeah. um, warp the, uh, the blank itself or come up with the right figure. Right. And also what kind of testing methodology you use? Do you use interference masks? Did you use knife edge testing? Um, uh, maybe I missed something during the presentation. I was no, no, going and, and, different rooms, but I'm yeah. curious. Yeah, no, and and that a lot of that's covered in in the first presentation. Um, but um, the um, the rough and fine grinding um, is done typically. What you do is once the once the the glass comes out of the kiln, um, you um, you would cast um, you would just make a plaster cast of the back of the mirror. 
And once you have that plaster cast, that's what the mirror will sit in during the rough and fine grinding so that basically you're supporting the mirror all along the curved, the curved back. Um, once you get to polishing, typically we've been doing polishing with mirror on top. Um, and so um, I'm going to stop the, the thing here. Um, so mirror on top, not tool on top. Yeah, mirror on top for the polishing. So tool on top for the rough and fine grinding, and then you yep. support the mirror from behind, um, right. and then um, and then and then mirror on top for the polishing. In you terms must of have to be awfully careful. Yep. Like you just can't really go at it like crazy. You could do with yeah. a thicker mirror. But well, I don't know. Yeah, and they're and they're full size tools. Is is the other right? Thing. Gotcha. Yeah, so because of the di diameter as well, right? So right. makes sense. Right, and then in terms of testing, um, the, the testing of choice is actually um, the Ronke test um, because it's really fast to do. Um, it's a qualitative test, so you're not getting numbers out, but, um, but it's very easy. Your eye becomes very, very sensitive to, right. um, uh, and in fact, I'm gonna show this one here. Yeah, yeah. so you can, you can look at this interference pattern and you can compare it to the theoretical and you can see deviations very, very easily. And now that I know that the, that the surface roughness was not the best on this mirror, you can actually see, you know, like lots of, like those lines really should be razor smooth and they're not. And I think that that really is the contributing factor to the high powered uh, performance or lack of it, um, uh, you know, for, for Artemis. So the Ronke is actually a very sensitive test and, and it lets you get really, really close. And then once you're super close, then you take it to a start. Give themselves another week to reach an agreement on a new stimulus. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, and then a star test is, is really the final arbiter um, for, for um, fleshing out, you know, any other minor imperfections in the figure. That's, that's fantastic. It's pretty neat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? A question. Yep. Randy? Yep. It's Bill. Uh, just the image of, uh, is it a lady or somebody sitting with the head covered? I'm oh. curious about that. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's just my desktop background. Uh, I, I, I believe oh. it's, a, it's a meditator, oh, it's meditator on the shores of the Ganges. I'm okay, not, it's not your photograph. No, no, it's not. Oh, it's not. Okay, okay. Thank you. No. Nope. All right, thank you very much, Tom. And uh, that's a great project. So yeah, looking forward to looking through that uh, telescope someday. Yep, my pleasure. Uh, okay, uh, our next speaker is uh, Nada Tijanic. And uh, we don't have uh, very many book reviews, but uh, Nada wants to share a book with us, uh, Astrophysics for Babies. So Nada, yes. you are up. Thank you. Um, one, of, one of the things I want to start with is, is actually Randy telling you and the board members, thank you for bringing us some normal. All right, I thought I unmuted. Um, I want to thank you and uh, Randy and all the board members for keeping these membership meetings going and especially for still having this great speakers that we do because um, my talk actually relates to a speaker we had here a few years ago, if people remember Dr. Tanya Harrison. And uh, she's a Canadian um, who is working in the United States um, related to the Mars rover. And she was telling us about her career. And um, I asked her for her Twitter handle at the time because I was brand new to Twitter and I thought this is a great person to follow. And consequently, as uh, some of you know, when you start following one person, you learn to follow other people. And so uh, I've started following other astronomers, astrophysicists, and end up uh, following a lot of scientists. Um, but one of the, uh, the people that I follow um, is um, an astrophysicist named James O'Donoghue, who is, I believe, British, but he's working in Japan right now. And um, James does a lot of great images. Well, this past year, James and his wife had a baby. And so James tweeted out a series of books that he bought for his baby. Uh, and um, as a book lover and 
a um, high school English teacher and um, a grandmother. We now have three grandchildren. Two were born this year. Um, I looked at those books and I went, wow, this is great. So what caught my eye was literally Astrophysics for Babies by Chris Ferry, uh, F-E-R-R-I-E. And I got this book and a bunch of other books written by him. He has, actually has this whole series of books for babies uh, and toddlers. And I wanted to share my love of astronomy with my family members. Um, I've had my daughters-in-law come out to see the International Space Station. Um, I took one and we um, observed the comet uh, before she had her baby, anyways, back in the summer. And um, so I bought some of these for my grandchildren uh, for Christmas presents. And I'm keeping a few here so when they come visit, uh, we're going to be reading them. And I just thought it would be interesting to share with other members who maybe have uh, grandchildren or great-grandchildren um, or their own children, uh, because it's a really wonderful series and it promotes um, the love of science and a love of astronomy. Okay, very uh, tough board book for those of you who remember, not just a page that's flimsy, but a board book. Very simple pictures with a simple text. Okay, um, this particular book also uh, not just teaches concepts. Okay, but in the end, and I noticed as an English teacher, look, the periodic table, um, it involves the children themselves and talks about uh, how the children are part of the stars. So uh, it says here, the very atoms inside your body were created by stars, right? And we see, um, again, other pictures, other concepts, but it, it helps promote, okay, this idea of science right from the very beginning, all right? And we've, we've got here, and you are part of this cycle. So I just thought it was really an excellent series that I wanted to share with everybody. Um, there is also ABCs of Space. We have a wonderful little book called Eight Little Planets um, that has holes, right? And so it starts out uh, from the furthest planet and then it describes all the other planets and we work our way down to the sun. So again, a whole series of books that teach um, our loved ones or teach children about the facts and science uh, that allow us to share our interest in astronomy. I just thought you might uh, enjoy learning about that. Thank you very much, Nada. That's, that's great. I want, I want to get my hands on those sometime. Yeah, Any questions bought, for Nada? I bought them through Indigo. Okay. Yeah, I'll put the name in the chat. Yes, please do. Any questions for Nada on that? Okay, so you, if you put the names in the chat, then uh, then that would be great. I just have a comment, Randy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to Nada. Nada, yeah. uh, my, my daughter is actually a teacher. Yeah. Uh, baby. So I'm all excited with your topic. So I have my first grandchild and my daughter is a teacher. Excellent. And, uh, oh my uh, God. So excited. They're so high quality, these books. I, I yeah. actually bought about eight or nine of them. He's got a whole series, but yeah. I really love the fact from the quality of the board book to yes. the quality of the illustrations mm -hmm. and, and just the way they incorporate all of these facts. I mean, this is yeah. really, you know, eight plus literature. Honestly. What the other book you mentioned? The second one you mentioned? Um, this one is called ABCs of Space. ABCs of Space. Okay, all right. Thank you, thank one, you. Yeah. Again, okay. you, can, uh, you can get it all at Indigo website. Indigo, all right. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm You're so welcome. excited. <laughs> Thanks again, Nara. Okay, the last presentation is... Uh, something that I'm going to, uh, to do here, uh, and it has to do with the uh, uh, upcoming eclipse of the sun this, uh, this summer. Uh, this is a, uh, an annual solar eclipse that's going to take place uh, in Northern Ontario. And uh, it's one of three eclipses that we can look forward to in the next uh, three years or so. 
Uh, so just as a bit of a background for those who uh, are new to astronomy, uh, a solar eclipse is when the sun moves in front, or the moon moves in front of the sun. And uh, Ron talked a little bit about uh, an eclipse that's coming up on, on Monday. Uh, so these things are, are not as rare as you would think, uh, but uh, they, they are rare if you expect to see one from your backyard. Uh, so the geometry is such that the moon passes in between the earth and the sun and just like you putting your hand up and blocking out the sun, the moon does that for you. Uh, we're rather fortunate that uh, the moon is 400 times closer to us than the sun, but it's also 400 times smaller so that they both appear more or less at the, uh, at the same angular size in the sky about a half a degree. So that's about the same size as, a, as an aspirin held at, uh, at arm's length. Uh, the Earth, uh, the, the moon is in uh, an elliptical orbit, which means that sometimes it's a little farther away from us in its orbit and other times it's a little closer. And that affects the kind of eclipse that we see, whether it's a, a total eclipse where the moon totally covers the sun or an annular eclipse when the moon a isn't quite doesn't quite appear to cover the entire sun and the, the bright part of the sun still forms an annulus around the around the moon so this is i always like this diagram because it shows you uh the difference in the size of the sun uh from earth during the year so the the sun is at its closest to us not in summertime but in in winter time at per perihelion and you can see that it, it's about 32, uh, nearly 33 arc minutes across uh, when it's at its closest and about 31 and a bit or nearly 32 arc minutes when it's at its farthest. So of course the, the angular diameter of the sun during eclipse is going to affect what we see, but also uh, the moon dramatically changes in angular size, whether it's at its closest point at perigee or closest or farthest point at apogee. And that difference between about 30 arc minutes and 30, uh, 33 arc, 34 arc minutes. So essentially uh, when the eclipse happens, uh, the position of the, the moon in its orbit, uh, you know, based on its closeness to apogee or perigee and the position we are in our orbit around the sun will determine exactly how big the moon appears with respect to the sun and whether you get it, it totally covers it or partially covers it. We had an annular eclipse in Toronto in May 1994. This is a picture I took. Uh, we, were, we were doing a TV show out in front of the McLaughlin Planetarium and uh, it was an annular eclipse. And you can see from this, this map that Toronto was just on the northern edge. In fact, downtown Toronto saw a, uh, an annular eclipse, but up in Downsview in North York, uh, they only saw a partial eclipse. So the eclipses, as I mentioned, they, they're, they're not rare. You get a couple of them every year, uh, but uh, for, to have an eclipse close to home, it's, it's, it's rather rare. This annular eclipse that I want to talk about this June starts in Northern Ontario and you can see it as a very broad red line moving from Ontario up into the, uh, into the Arctic. Here's a view from the sun looking at the earth and you can see that, uh, you know, it looks like a curved, it's a curved line on the, on the curved earth, but actually it's a, if from the moon, uh, if you were on the moon looking at the earth, it would just be the moon is moving in a straight line and the path would appear to be a straight line. But once you plot it on the earth, it's actually a curved line. So because it's so close to the northern edge of the earth, the uh, shadow of the moon will be really spread out. And that's why the path appeared so, uh, so wide in the previous picture. Here's a view from directly overhead. And you can see that the annular phase actually passes over the North Pole. For the eclipse. So here is a, um, a okay here is a uh, animation that's not going to work today but that's fine it's, it's Friday so that's that's no problem. Um, <clears throat> the eclipse uh, this diagram is actually wrong 
I noticed that today <clears throat> I picked it up. Uh, I don't remember where I picked it up. This says eclipse begins at sunrise. It means the annular phase begins at sunrise right here, just, just east of Thunder Bay. So if you're in Thunder Bay at sunrise uh, on June 10th, this is what you'll see. You'll see the uh, sun rising uh, partially eclipsed and there'll be, uh, it'll be quite a, a crescent sun. Uh, if you move a little bit farther east, maybe towards where that yellow circle is, and I just plotted in the latitude longitude on a, in a program, then you'll see what the, those people will see. And that is it, it, the sun will rise uh, annually, annually eclipse. And that'll, that would be just a spectacular thing to see. <clears throat> For us here in Mississauga, uh, sunrise will be at 5.40 in the morning. So it'll be an early wake up call. Again, this is close to uh, getting close to uh, the solstice. But we'll see a spectacular crescent sun rising over the northeast horizon. Now we all have to be careful when we look at the sun due to the uh, during the partial eclipse the uh, the brightness of the sun and the ultraviolet and infrared rays are, are harmful so uh, fortunately for us uh, during partial phases uh, and this is a partial during this is a total eclipse but the partial phase the filter usually um, changes the color of the uh, the partially eclipsed sun orange, and that's what this looks, what this is showing. Uh, for your telescope, you'll want to buy a filter that will just slip over the end of the, uh, where the light comes into the telescope. That will prevent the heat from building up inside your telescope. Uh, some of the older telescopes actually had little filters that you screwed onto the eyepiece. You should throw those out because they tend to heat, heat up and crack and, and they can uh, do damage. Uh, a way to project the uh, image of the sun during an eclipse is to use uh, uh, this projection method. Here on the right hand side, I'm projecting with binoculars a partial phase and with binoculars, of course, you get two eclipses for the price of one. <laughs> uh, but these days, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, cheap way, in inexpensive way and safe way to watch an eclipse is to purchase uh, these uh, solar glasses, mylar glasses. And they are usually uh, quite available these days during, during eclipses. For the 2017 eclipse, uh, the RESC bought 25,000 uh, eclipse glasses and distributed them, distributed them across the country. Now, as I mentioned, this eclipse in Northern Ontario is the first of a, a couple of three interesting eclipses. Here you can see the 2017 eclipse that went diagonally across the US, the total eclipse a few years ago. In 2023, there will be another annular eclipse that starts in the Northwest US and passes down through Texas and then out into the Gulf of Mexico. So that'll be an opportunity to, to see another annular eclipse. Uh, but the eclipse we're waiting for is uh, in 2024, the one which will pass through uh, uh, the US and then up through Canada, through Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, PEI, and uh, Newfoundland. And uh, I don't know why these aren't working today, but again, that's, you know, that's showbiz. So here's a map showing the 2024 eclipse. Again, many of you have probably have seen this, but it's Good just to keep a reminder that uh, we've got this event coming pretty close to us in, in just uh, three and a bit years. So the path uh, essentially goes across Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. Uh, the North Shore of Lake Erie, Niagara Falls, Hamilton will uh, see totality. Toronto and Mississauga are unfortunately uh, shut out. And uh, this map uh, getting down to a higher resolution shows that the northern path of the eclipse uh, essentially just cuts out into the lake. It looks like down by the Ford plant in Oakville, maybe, uh, maybe down, downtown Oakville. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're going to have to uh, either drive down to Hamilton, Niagara Falls, or uh, over towards Belleville uh, to see this eclipse, but it certainly will be uh, close to see. And just to remind people what you see during totality, and Ron mentioned this in his talk, uh, there are many things to see during a total eclipse. When the, the moon totally covers the sun, then you don't need the solar filters. 
the corona around the, uh, the, the moon is, is about as bright as the full moon. Uh, you know, just before the eclipse, you can see the shadow of the moon racing towards you at about 1, 1,500 kilometers an hour. Uh, and then there's, there's the brilliant uh, prominences on the limb of the sun uh, that you can see just with your naked eye. Here's a series of photos that of just coming into totality that I took uh, in Turkey in 2006. And it's interesting to watch the last bit of sunlight break in, up into little beads that they call uh, Bailey's beads. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the eclipse that we had in uh, 2017 was uh, just under three minutes. The one we're going to have in 2024, I believe is, is over four minutes, even closer to four and a half minutes. So again, that's the difference <coughs> in the position of the moon and the earth in, their, in its orbits. Uh, the moon, probably the moon is closer to us in its orbit, so it appears bigger, so it takes longer for the sun to reappear on the, uh, on the side of the moon after the moon totally covers it. And uh, I love this picture because I think it, it, it captures realistically what the sky looks like during totality. It's not totally dark, uh, but planets, uh, uh, inner planets definitely are visible. And if any of the outer planets are near the sun, you can easily see them. I actually saw Capella during an eclipse, uh, that, that eclipse in Turkey. Uh, and I was kind of surprised to see that, but uh, you don't start looking for stars and constellations during a, a short total eclipse. But you do see this beautiful sunset color along the horizon as well. So anyone who's been there is this is sort of reliving your experience and anyone who hasn't seen one definitely plan to, uh, to s try to see the 2024 eclipse. And as Ron mentioned, uh, the one in uh, uh, South America on Monday passes uh, through Chile and Argentina. And a lot of people are disappointed that they were not able to go to that one. And uh, that's my presentation. Any, uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, if there are no questions, then uh, let me uh, thank everyone for coming and uh, remind you that uh, our next meeting is on January 15th, and that will be a potpourri meeting. And uh, I wish, uh, on behalf of the, uh, the Mississauga Center Council, I wish everyone a, a safe and happy holiday. Stay safe and uh, take precautions, socially distance, wear your masks, and uh, hopefully we'll get that nice, clear, cold evening on December 21st uh, to see the uh, Ven uh, Venus, Jupiter and Saturn nice and close. So anyway, thank you very much, everybody. Take care, and uh, we'll see you in the new year. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Great session. Thank you. Hey, you're Stop welcome. Presenters. Good stuff. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Merry Dennis. Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas. It was great. Thanks, Francine. Take care. Merry Christmas to everybody and be safe. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thanks, Jose. Merry Christmas and a happy new year, everyone. Yeah. Yes. Hey, Lukash. <laughs> Take care. Merry Christmas. Happy new year. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, guys. Yes. Hey, you too. Yeah. Thank you, Randy, for all the different pooperies and other presentations. Oh, you're welcome. Glad Thank you, you like it. Thank you. Wonderful. Just, just wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Thanks.